All right, everyone, we're gonna do a quick little deep dive and we're gonna see how illiterate I actually am. So this is a research article. Um, it is from doi.org.10.33, ha, 33, fnet.2021, f787225. Okay, um, this is a bunch of science dudes and this paper is extremely hard to read and um, I've read it and I can give you the gif of it and what I was actually trying to get to. Um, what these guys were trying to figure out um, is th this. I, and you will see what I mean when I, when I start reading this. But um, the, first th the first thing you should know, and I'll take you to a little part right here. The only thing that you really need to understand real quick is that paraxathene is essentially what caffeine burns off at. So essentially, we'll just read this part real quick. Caffeine is the most frequently consumed psychostimulant worldwide. After an acute PO administration, 99% of the caffeine is rapidly absorbed within 45 minutes, which brings the peak plasma concentration of caffeine at one to two hours after the intake. The average half-life of caffeine after an acute consumption is 2.5 to 5 hours. While it can be modulated by the ingested doses, smoking, genetic variants, health status, oral contraceptives and pregnancy and various other factors, uh, approximately 84% of the caffeine is transformed into parazaxthene. I think, I don't know if that's right. Paraza paraxanthine, paraxanthine. Through the process of three methyl demethylation by the heptic cytochrome P41A2 enzyme uh, CYP1A2. Okay, that's it, right? So essentially what you end up with, you don't end up with caffeine in your system. You end up with this stuff right here, paraax, paranzaxthine. I, xanthine, I gotta get that right. Okay, so what this, this entire bunch of university people, and this is, these are the people that wrote this, this end research on what this is. It's the University of Psychiatric Clinics, Basel in, in Switzerland, and it's like places like the Research Platform, Molecule and Cognitive Neurosciences, uh, Neuropsychiatry, uh, Psychiatry, and Brain Imaging, uh, University Psychiatric Clinics. Uh, so it's all a bunch of brain people, right? So this is what it is. And these are all the scientists in on this. And what they are trying to figure out is if you're drinking caffeine and it turns into this paraxine, does it ever leave your body by the time you intake another drink in the morning? And so this is the this is an interesting read. Okay, so it, take it for what it is. Caffeine elicits widespread effects in the central nervous system, and is the most frequently consumed psychostimulant worldwide. First evidence indicates that during daily intake, the elimination of caffeine may slow down, and the primary metabolite paraxanthine may accumulate. The neural impact of such adaptations is virtually unexplored. In this report, we leverage the data of a laboratory study with N equals 20 participants and three within subject conditions. Caffeine at 150 milligrams of caffeine times three times a day times 10 days. There was a placebo group that had 150 milligrams mannitol, whatever that is, times three days times 10 days. And the acute caffeine deprivation group, caffeine times nine days afterward, placebo one day. So when it's... it's yeah, so anyway, on day 10, we determined the course of the salivary caffeine and paraxanthine using liquid chromatography mass spectrometry coupled with tandem mass spectrometry. We assessed gray matter, so GM, remember that part, GM intensity and cerebral blood flow, CBF, after acute caffeine deprivation as compared to changes in the caffeine condition from our previous report. The results indicated that the levels of paraxanthine and caffeine remained high and were carried overnight during daily intake, and that the levels of paraxanthine remained elevated after 30, 24, of, 24 hours of caffeine deprivation compared to placebo. After 36 hours of caffeine deprivation, the previously reported caffeine-induced GM reduction was partially mitigated, while CBF, uh, which is the... Uh, cerebral blood flow was elevated compared to placebo. Our findings unveil that uh, conventional daily caffeine intake does not provide sufficient time to clear up the psychoactive compounds and restore cerebral responses even after 36 hours of abstinence. They also suggest investigating the consequences of a paraxanthine accumulation during daily caffeine intake. 
Okay, so essentially this stuff is building up in your system and at some level you may probably never sleep well is what I, I kind of got from that. Um, this is all a whole bunch of really, really hard stuff to read. And where I was wanting to go is down here a little bit. Uh, gray matter, 40 hours. Because a lot of you guys right now are, I, I know, including my wife, they are um, having headaches and things of this nature. And so, let's see. Let's see where this is. The present study estimates that the kinetics of caffeine and parasitic response to genome could be a typical. Um, let's see. So there was a point I wanted to daily repeat it and take caffeine. is a very common phenomenon that occurs in adults. Okay, so this is not it. Um, this is a really good read. I will absolutely leave the links in there. Um, this, is this it? Long-term neurocognitive. So here we go. So early GWAS did not support the association between... No, that's actually not it. Hold on. This is where it gets really crazy because... Um, do we should recover. Withdrawal. Okay, so this is very interesting. Withdrawal re responses commonly occur after discontinuing regular caffeine intake. While our reports elsewhere have discussed in detail the implications of cerebral effects of caffeine, the current analysis further added that these changes might take longer than the interval of day-to-day -day intakes to recover. We corroborated the caffeine cessation-induced vasco vascodilation by the elevated CBF, which could be attributed to the enhanced adenosine-modulated vasodilation after chronic caffeine exposure was also frequently observed during increased sleep pressure, such as in the evening compared to morning, and sleep restriction and sleep deprivation. In line with the literature, the cognitive responses in the same volunteers reported elsewhere included reduced vigilance, increased sleepiness, and enhanced sleep depth confirmed that the participants were experiencing a solid withdrawal state. Um, there was something else in here. There it is. Is this it? Okay, so this is how they're actually, um, talking about, like, getting off of it. While combating withdrawal symptoms are often the reason to consolidate the daily repeated consumption of caffeine, the typical daily repeated caffeine intake, however, is unlikely to provide enough time for a full withdrawal-driven restoration. The first evidence from our observation in the overnight residuals of caffeine and paraxine levels, which were measured at 17 hours after the last intake. Furthermore, during the 24 to 43 hour of caffeine deprivation, while the caffeine levels were nearly cleared, the paraxine levels remained elevated. In other words, a reputation of intake shorter than this time window is most likely to be sufficient for the full elimination of both caffeine and paraxine. So this is stuff, you know, this is a hardcore drug. When you look at this kind of stuff and you look at the effects of it and look how long it stays in your system and what it does. And this is all these people, the brain science people, they're all the ones trying to figure this stuff out. Um, there was one more, there was one more point. Okay, so let's see what the significance says. Caffeine is, cons is consumed on a daily basis among 80% of the worldwide population. It is of importance to be aware that daily consumption, even merely in the daytime, can accumulate exposure to the psychostimulant and prevent the body from full recovery. The in-progress recovery from a reduced GM and the elevated CBF after 36 hours of caffeine cessation entails a longer time required for full restoration than the conventional repetition of daily intake. On the other hand, the accumulation of paraax and xanthine underscores the importance to investigate its cognitive and physiological effects, which may be responsible for long-term outcomes of chronic exposure to caffeine. I'll try this one. Methodolo methodologically, the adapted metabolism also suggests a careful consideration to translate acute effects of caffeine onto daily usage. Finally, responses of GM and CBF in both the caffeine condition and after 36 hours of caffeine deprivation emphasize the importance of restricting caffeine intake when studying cerebral morphometry and neurovascular activities. Um, this is the thing, right? And I think somebody was telling me that it didn't matter that blood flow wasn't restricted in your head. Um, I think it's the same guy that said I was like a religious zealot or something. But when you are dealing with, uh, C, where is it, CBF, cerebral blood flow, right? And this is what comes back, your cerebral blood flow. When you stop drinking caffeine and the paraxine comes out of your system, you, 
you recover, right? Your brain has to go through a, a change, a complete change. Uh, and it, if you have extended use, even with one cup of coffee, it says it affects all sorts of stuff and it builds up over time. And so over time, this has got to be something completely unhealthy. So, you know, this is more, um, more stuff, just research that I'm, I'm finding out, researching. I find it interesting. And I know people at 153news.net will find this interesting. And everything I can research about caffeine tells me it is very dangerous. And I know there's guys like, oh, it keeps you alive and does. It, it may do something somewhere, but by the time your heart and your vessels and your 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 brain recover from this kind of damage, it doesn't matter what it's going to save because you're going to be dead from the effects of that. So that's it. Hope you guys have a good day. I'm out.